Hi, today I would like to share five books that I believe are helpful to either new or experienced reenactors in understanding the life, peoples and times of late medieval Europe. The first book is The Merchant of Prato. I recently gave a brief review of this book over on my Facebook page. This book summarizes the letters of Francisco de Tini. A Florentine merchant, de Tini was able to establish a trading empire spanning from Spain to northern France through a network of agents and partners. We are able to see the beginnings of mercantile and commercial capitalism through the hand of de Tini and his kind. Through his letters, we're able to see how he establishes his empire. We're also able to see how he is able to deal with the very difficult political and social catastrophes of the time. As Dottini and his kind were merchants, they were on the cusp of what was reasonable uh, in society. We can see that medieval sensibilities were offended by usury and profit. Um, Dottini on more than one occasion coming afoul of, of the law and, and the town fathers for not paying taxes and, and levies um, that were put against him for his large amount of wealth. Um, I'd also suggest um, this book for anyone who is a textile nerd. Uh, it goes into great detail on the trade um, and the local weaving processes um, and just the Italian wool trade in, in general. We're given a unique perspective on how Dottini's household was run. The letters don't just contain his business matters, but also his family matters. He lived away from his wife for large portions of his life. Uh, it's very interesting because he wasn't a very easy man to get along with. Um, and because his wife wasn't able to have children, um, that drove a very large wedge between them. So we see that interaction. He fathered children uh, with other women, um, and that's very interesting too, and how that dynamic affected their family. Um, we also see him giving demands or uh, directions on how the household was to be run and what items should be purchased and how his house should be built. So that's very uh, interesting just from that perspective as well and how uh, a 14th century house or family would be run in, in the manner of, of the bourgeois in the, in the late 14th century. So that's just interesting in itself. So this is a very good book. I do recommend it. The next book is The Paston Letters. This is a compilation of several generations of the Paston family writing backwards and forwards to each other. Um, the Pastons live in Norwich in England um, and the letters are written between the early 14th century into the 16th century. Um, we are still able to see the family interactions in a great deal during a very turbulent period in English history. Uh, so the War of the Roses and the, the plague and uh, very interesting how this family deals with um, those issues. Um, and we were able to see their experiences and how they were just trying to raise their family's wealth um, and uh, place in society. Um, importantly, the Passion Letters do give us a glimpse into their struggles uh, and they are able to um, establish their place during that chaotic period. Um, importantly, the past and letters give us a glimpse at a real struggle of the family trying to establish their place in a really chaotic period of English history. Uh, potentially we see the family rise from bonded peasantry uh, into a place of wealth and power. Um, so the, the patriarch of the family was actually accused in one of the letters um, of coming from uh, bonded peasantry um, after the Black Death and, and rising up into this position and and it's it maybe even taking a gamble on the family where eventually they become quite wealthy and influential and that's quite a common story um, post black death many people going and fleeing towards the cities and becoming free or many people taking up uh, crafts or um, taking over farms that were empty so this is a story that isn't uncommon or um, unfamiliar to those who research this kind of thing. Um, this 
this, however, is very interesting because we have an accusation that uh, this person used to be a peasant, used to be bonded, but however is essentially hidden that fact and, and is now working towards the wealth of this family. So that's quite interesting. Um, and this is a st story about the rise of the middle class. So that's really interesting uh, to see that moving on and, and how the middle class uh, established themselves from uh, bonded peasants. Um, so this book, uh, much like The Merchant of Prato, can be used to confirm the existence of items or practices that uh, scholarly texts may not necessarily discuss. Um, we may not necessarily um, see those as primary sources. They may not exist, but we can we can confirm because the the letters do talk about it. So um, there are accounts here where family members are talking about get such and such amount of wool because I wish to make this dress or whatever else. So that's quite interesting. Moving on to our next book, we have the Chronicles of Frossard. Uh, Frossard was a 14th century chronicler and poet, uh, and unlike the previous books, um, I believe it's important to understand or remember that Frossard was paid or hired to chronicle by quite wealthy people, um, and, and he had this bias uh, because of that. It's not to say that the other people writing their letters to their families didn't have a bias, but this guy has definitely got a bias. Um, much like biased media um, today where we talk about fake news or um, biased media. He's definitely writing with an intent um, to um, keep his patrons happy. Um, he's not going to write anything that's going to dissatisfy or, or upset his patrons because they're paying his wages. Um, at the same time, Frossard also absolutely and utterly in love with the idea of um, chivalry and chivalric practices and virtues and he's actually uh, attributed with the rise of uh, chivalry um, in the late medieval period because of his writings in the chronicles and, and his poetry so um, that's quite interesting. Frossard was employed to write this history. He clearly has a bias for his patrons and the maintaining of the status quo. Frossart was entirely infatuated with the notions of chivalry and knighthood. His role as a chronicler was to legitimize the violence of the state and maintain the dominance of the ruling class. He attempts to discredit the actions of the peasants' revolt and the jacquerie. He attempts to discredit the actions of the peasant revolt and the jacquerie, comparing the actions of the jacquerie as to animals. He condemns those who rebel against the status quo as wicked and evil, and he compares those in the Peasants' Revolt as evil men and wanting to cause chaos. And this is, is clear in his language when he compares those that fight against them, those that maintain the status quo as good and virtuous. However, he does frame the peasant uprising in the Flemish lowlands in a much gentler light, detailing the Whitehood revolts, and he writes of those as, as a much more po in a much more positive way. So, once again, he's got a bias because he's from that area. He's from Hainault. So, we can see he's leaning towards these biases. Um, and that's another reason why I really like... Uh, um, Frossard's Chronicles from a biased point of view, so we're talking about biases here because the lowlands are, are a particular interest to me, um, particular, um, the, in particular, should I say, um, the Whitehood Revolts, I really do find that period of time um, very interesting and once again that's where I choose to uh, build my impressions from, so um, read Frossard, Keep in mind that this guy's got a mission. This aside, we can still use his works to understand people. This aside, we can still use his works to understand how people thought and deferred to the ruling classes, 
and how the ruling classes may have viewed themselves at the time. Next up, we have Barbara Tushman's Through a Distant Mirror, A Calamitous 14th Century. I would highly recommend this book as a primer to anyone interested in understanding the life and times of the 14th century, starting off as a 14th century reenactor. Uh, as you can see, my book is well read. Uh, it's been repaired a couple of times. Uh, I love this book so much, I have an audio copy. Um, this, however, is not a primary source. Uh, however, Barbara has been able to uh, compile a staggering amount of resources to tell the chilling tale um, of the collapse and rebirth of the 14th century. Um, while this is not an academic work, say for example, in comparison to many of the books behind me, okay, um, she has been able to create this absolutely and utterly compelling story um, about one of the most chaotic periods of, of human history. Um, from the sudden and disastrous storms in the early quarter of the 14th century, which led to famine, then on the back of that we have the Black Death wiping out whole towns and villages without rhyme or reason. Uh, unending war between England and France and their proxies, uh, banditry and depredation by the routiers. Yet from these calamities we see the rise of the middle class and the notion of the modern state. People in the 14th century believed that they were living in the times of Arthur. That is to say the end times where both Arthur would return to fight the last battle but also the biblical end times. In their minds, the two were ultimately linked. The events confirm this. And when I read this book and other accounts of the Black Death, I'm struck by how terrible it must have been, where whole villages were wiped out. It reminds me of a zombie apocalypse movie where you see you know, the, the absolute death and destruction and people wandering through these cities full of bodies. Um, and I'll be talking about the Black Death in, in a later video. Um, finally, I'd like to talk about Chaucer and the Canterbury Tales. Uh, this book is important for so many reasons. Uh, one of them being that Chaucer wrote this book in the English vernacular, meaning it was one of the first masterpieces uh, not to be written in either Latin or French, setting the precedent for future English poets and writers to do the same. Chaucer was one of uh, the contemporaries for Frossart and Plutarch, um, so he was in good company there. Um, Canterbury Tales is quite easy to get copies of. Uh, there's multiple reprints. You can read it for free online. Um, the BBC actually did a quite good claymation version of this well. Um, it's, it's funny. Um, and I, I really enjoy reading it. Um, although the characters in Canterbury Tales are caricatures, it's through these exaggerations we can see the truths of the late 14th century society. For example, we know the prior speaks French in, in Canterbury Tales, yet it is clear the French she speaks is someone who's never been to France. It's someone who's only been taught the French in school. For example, she is a vain and shallow person. That's what he's alluding to. Uh, the satire is an example of the people of the time. Uh, much like the modern satirist uh, who holds the lens up to society as an example of the people of the time, um, so we can, you know, evaluate ourselves, um, Chaucer is doing the same. Um, we can better observe late medieval society through the satirist as it lays the worst of its kind out to air. These things chroniclers like Frossart wouldn't care to do. He wouldn't care to show um, his, his patrons as being flawed people. In fact, he does the opposite. He's legitimizing their behaviors. Um, so we can also use Canterbury Tales, however, to observe the material culture. We see references to the knight having a jupon made of fustian, um, or the yeoman having a sword and buckler. We also can see 
descriptions of leather armor in one of the tales. Um, um, and I'm going to be talking about it in the future reconstruction, so stay tuned for that one. Um, so, not only are we looking at these from a, a social perspective, all of these books we are going to be looking at from a material culture perspective. So five books that I believe are important from either a perspective of a new or experienced reenactor. And they are important because we can extract an understanding of the people of the time, not just the material culture of the time. By understanding the social practices and the psychology of important, and that's what's important. The psychology of the people and their material conditions is what influences the material culture. I believe it is not necessarily the actions of the kings, presidents, popes and generals that shaped our history. Instead, it is the actions of the little people, people like you and me, who are responsible for the history we have today. It is definitely true for the late medieval period and the rise of the middle class, the cities and the guilds that led us to the modern period. This is why it is important for us to understand our history, not through dates and places and time, or battles and kings, but through the people behind the scenes. So what do you think? Do you agree? Do you disagree? Please leave a comment, give a thumbs up, thumb down, and please remember to subscribe.